Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeremy Robinson. I'm a graduate in the Emerging Media MFA in Studio Art and Design. At this time, I would like to thank my thesis committee, Byron Clerks, Carla Poindexter, and Dr. Melissa Geppert for their support and insight throughout this journey. I would like to also thank my sister, Aubrey, who shares the same journey I have shared. And a special thank you to my wife, Jessica, who has shown me what family truly means. In this presentation, I will address familial themes of my early life and early works. I will also discuss the maternal impact on my creative process, the works on intangibility, materiality, and transference, along with works of ephemerality and trauma. Through these works, I will address my practice and process of confronting trauma. Spawned from a family of criminals, drug addicts, and abusers, I find myself to be an exception by not taking part in this family tradition. At a young age, I was regaled by stories of a dysfunctional family celebrating despair and follies, a family so unaware of their own trauma. With the benefit of hindsight and cognizance, my immediate family appeared to have two paths to follow. Both paths were driven by the patriarchal figurehead of my parents. One, Papa, was described as a caring provider for the family. The other, Pipa, the local town brawler. Both of my grandfathers deceased before I could meet them, but my parents, given these two opposing pathways, chose to follow in the footsteps of the brawler. My family was not perfect, no family is, but this family was never remorseful in the trauma they imposed on themselves or others. From beatings to punishments, all chalked up to, by my mother to be lessons of life. My sister and I constantly left to learn the hard way. Given my mother's adoptive philosophy of na nature over nurture, as my sister would later put it, we were destined to be raised by wolves. Isolated and sheltered from the world only to explore our home together. I remember as a child, I was obsessed over one particular movie when in our home, The Wizard of Oz. To my sister's discontent, I watched this film ad nauseum. The reason this film resonates with me to this day is the prominent tagline, there's no place like home. To a child bound within a house of trauma, the meaning of home never seemed so subjective. As a grown man, the notion of home still haunts me. As a first time homeowner and a husband, I often find elements of my childhood trauma bleeding into the newly found space. About the notion of power within architecture and space, Prime Minister Winston Churchill once stated, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. Whether it's closing the blinds in the daytime, locking doors behind me, or yearning for isolation by sleeping alone on the couch, I am a product shaped by my childhood home. Furthering my artistic practice by attending graduate school in the School of Visual Arts and Design at UCF, here I began to explore and confront themes of traumatic experiences and innocence lost within my work. The initial purpose of my work within the first semester of my graduate studies was to identify and correlate aspects of the American guilt and pacification of traumatic childhood events. Through trial and error of my first semester, I eventually found my footing and voice as an artist. I started my graduate studies solidified with a body of work I wanted to produce. I had already answered the what's, what I wanted to create, what materials I wanted to use, and what I intended to convey within my practice. However, creating works with good intention, whether highlighting innocence lost within war or speaking on current events of child endangerment and immigration, fixated on highlighting social injustices within our society. My ideas started to seem sporadic and one dimensional. My creative plan was completely derailed by one question, why? Shown, as, shown here as an example of early themes, here I ventured to create a piece that was also personal in nature, a part of my family history and my piece, Howdy Do, Howdy Do a kitsch sculpture resembling a Vietnam memorial. The importance of portraying the puppet Howdy Doody alludes to the innocence of the 1950s generation, my father's generation, the same generation like my father that would soon be drafted into the Vietnam War. During a studio visit with the curator of the Orlando Museum of Art, we presented our works for review, glaring into the grinning face of my knockoff Howdy Doody statue without a glance my way. The curator advised me that I should stray away from the works about my father. He was fortuitously correct. While he was possibly alluding to the theme of my works rather than the specific subject, nevertheless, 
Nevertheless, he is right. I shouldn't be focusing on my father. I should address the internalized fears and trauma unduly suppressed within myself. My work should be bigger than my father. It needed to be about my mother. Finding common threads and themes throughout proverbial representations of the mother within the judgment of King Solomon and the Chitaka story of the sage. These stories both involving the dilemma of a mother of two mothers claiming ownership of a child. The end result revealing the true mother would not want undue harm brought upon a child. Dutch Israeli biblical scholar Athaler Bruner Enid analyzes the judgment of King Solomon between two women yearning to be mother, expressing an important lesson to be derived from the tale is that true maternal feelings, an extremely important thing for preservation of social continuity, may exist even in the bosom of the lowliest woman. Wrestling with the magnitude of confronting the presence of my mother, a large ominous presence in my life, I allude to the contrasting benevolent presence and embodiment of the mother within Louise Bourgeois' The Spider. Cast in bronze, standing at almost nine feet tall with legs extended outward, Occupying the surrounding area, the spider evokes a comforting encroachment of space, addressing her maternal symbolism of weaving and protection by the mother, validated by her poem, Ode to My Mother. While further researching Bourgeois, I also became aware of the works about her father, specifically finding inspiration in the destruction of her father, eviscerating and tearing apart the imagery of her father. Bourgeois cathartically settles the score, engulfed within paternal disdain. She recalls the actions of infidelity, cruelty, and fear of her father. Bourgeois expresses a therapeutic process of art in confronting the subject. She states, the destruction of the father deals with fear, ordinary garden variety fear, the actual physical fear that I still feel today. What interests me is the conquering of the fear, the hiding, the running away from it, facing it, excusing it, being ashamed of it, and finally being afraid of being afraid. This is the subject. Another influence within my practice is Edward Kingholz, whose works often focus on the gritty underbelly of Americana culture and investigate the defunct romanticism of the wholesome American family. <clears throat> Kingholz describes his works as echoing the degraded, filthy qualities of his materials. His sculptures and tableau often evoke American society, sexual prudery, political corruption, oral hypocrisy, and oppression of marginalized groups. These works are designed to evoke complicit responses of revulsion and guilt, often making viewers feel complicit with their atrocities. The allusion to childhood trauma and decay of nurture is evident in Kingholz's mother scurly revisited. Pressed between a rally blouse and disheveled high heels lay a baby doll, disfigured and impaled with the empty high heels. Inviting bourgeois process of cathartic resolution, I reduced my mother to an enormous pair of withered, decaying, disembodied breast in my work titled, I Am Sunny Jim. Building these body parts of my mother in pieces, I start to cut and stitch them together using nylon and punch needles to break through the rugged material, embracing an act of mending and binding together these synthetic materials. This represents both a maternal overbearance and maternal void, showcasing the emptiness and disassociation between symbolism and nurture in my reality, nature. Drawing a comparison to the impact of the mother's presence within Keenholz's piece, even though the subjects themselves are physically absent, it leads me to believe an emotional maternal absence is represented. I am Sunny Jim alludes to maternal nature versus nature, nature versus nurture, a depiction of maternal indifference. To achieve an absence of the mother, I substitute the symbolic and corporeal softness and warmth of skin with a rigid texture of and harshness of fairly fully cured wood glue. An allusion to a strained or broken relationship made by the presence of the wig loop within the piece, a material commonly used for repair or binding is now used to refer to a broken bond I feel with my mother. This new approach to using wig glue as a material within my practice and process was completely accidental. Evacuating my studio space due to a worldwide pandemic in early 2020, I had to abandon my works in progress at the time. I was erecting a fully <laughs> sized iron maiden out of wood. Unknowingly from this process, I had left a puddle of wood glue out in the open. Once I returned to gather tools and supplies before the campus went on lockdown, I was struck by this material, this malleable and translucent form of wood glue 
seemingly in a transitional state of turning from a liquid into a solid. As a tribute to my mother's insensitive philosophy of nature over nurture throughout my childhood, I chose to process the wiggle outside for this piece, leaving the material vulnerable to be manipulated by outside elements of nature, rain, wind, bugs. As seen here, the changing humidity and wind patterns have caused ripple patterns during the drying process. The ensuing texture of the atrophied wood glue symbolizes the effect of the natural forces that encase the embedded photography, photograph of my mother holding me as a child. Seen are various bugs and debris that became trapped within the wood glue wall. It was in a liquid state, ultimately becoming unwilling participants in my deception and depiction of the illusion of nurture in a world governed by the forces of nature. These details further this nature versus nurture theme by revealing the unwitting insects alongside an inscription atop the displayed gold breast that represent a lullaby my mother would later see me before I go to bed. The lullaby shown here is Lulu had a baby. This lullaby represents allegorical follies of an inept mother named Lulu and her baby named Sonny Jim who is left by chance to survive in whimsical melodrama. To me, this lullaby is indicative of a story involving a maternal figure surrounded by cavalier negligence. The irony my mother serenaded me as a child with a lullaby comprised of child neglect is completely non-cognizant and irrational. Referring back to the archetype of the mother in bourgeois larger than life spider, I expand the scale of my mother's bodily presence, addressing the larger than life mythology of the mother. These oversized breasts reduce the viewer to a childlike size. The magnitude of the mother's presence and absence are represented at once. Hungarian psychoanalyst Sandor Frenzy presents trauma as a concussion, producing a split in the personality. In order to illustrate the split, he uses a whole series of images, splitting off of a dead part, killed by the violence of the shock, enabling thus the rest to live a normal life, but with part of the personality missing and out of reach like a sort of cyst inside the personality or multiple splits under the effect of repeated shocks, which may go as far as atomization, the personality fragments in order to present a larger surface area to the shock. The aspect of shedding of skin and evolution of self found within my next piece, skin. Skin is a reaction to the shedding of the self, representing a feeling of returning to that which felt safe, but is now decayed. Treating the material differently as in my previous work, I Am Sunny Jim, I incorporate the essence of self-preservation by curing the wood glue material in a controlled environment, now representing an element of nurture. The scale my body is represented within the surface area of the piece, stitched together and lined with synthetic feelers. Here we see a detail of those feelers and the layering of material within the place. The feelers representing a coping mechanism within the self creating a safe space, a space that cannot be achieved again due to the split caused by trauma. This reflection upon my childhood left me focused on aspects of trauma that still follow. A feeling of transience within space, an ephemeral process of awakening trauma, like a slow gas leak, a silent killer, realized only when it's too late. Separating myself from the body in the presence of my mother, I expand the idea of trauma within transference, a phenomenon that expresses a redirection of childhood emotions into a substitute, a substitute reference. That for me is represented by domestic spaces. My practice shifted to address the transitory aspects of transference within domestic space, incorporating themes of corporeality and trauma. Furthering this concept of transference within a domestic landscape, I expand on the idea of trauma transferring from space to space, lingering in the depths of my mind, unshakable. In awe by the sheer, no pun intended, mastery of Doho Su, is the use of wire and fabric to recreate ethereal imagery and memory of space, I began to expound upon my practice within the subconsciousness of recall. Doho Su captures the fleeting ephemeral qualities of space, as seen in his work aptly titled Passages. This work fashioned from translucent fabric and wire replicates the in-between passages of transitory spaces, hallways, doorways, foyers, etc capturing elements of space that are often unseen. Sue evokes a subconsciousness of space, occupied in a fleeting moment. He states, I see life as a passageway with no fixed beginning or destination. We tend to focus on the destination all the time and forget about the in-between spaces. 
Enthralled by Dohusu's passages, I began to reconsider the ethereal qualities of my space within my work. My piece sheets allude to a childhood memory of hiding and running throughout my grandmother's laundry, often comprised of sheets hung out to dry. I began to reflect on the aspect of solace, a of discovering a safe space, a space of tranquility and silence from reality within a veil of translucent fabric within my piece. Cast in one glue and printed from the door layered with it in a wax coated bed sheet, subtle textures are registered from those linens. Draped over the limpness of the piece alludes to a corporeal form of tiredness, fatigue, and defeat. The wax coating adhering to the wood glue forms of an opaqueness, referring back to the corporeal aesthetic of shed skin, alluding to a transitionary state of being. Likened to skin in transitional forms, the color tones allude to temporality within decaying and the serenity of light permeating throughout the skin, much like a closed eyelid, referring back to a place of solace within memory and feeling. Referencing the transference of trauma still readily present within my domestic routine, the aesthetic of the doors repurposed as sheets alludes to an aspect of isolation within the home that allows for a detachment from the world. Creating a space that forms a passage, I evoke a sense of wariness, comfort, and familiarity by inviting the viewer to pass through the opening between the sheets, thus allowing for a moment of isolation and serenity. Sandra Forenzi defines trauma as a concussion, reaction to an unbearable external or internal stimulus in an autoplastic manner, modifying the self, instead of an alloplastic manner, modifying the stimulus. My piece untitled Slump characterizes aspects of being invisible to the public eye. An overlooked figure, dis disregarded in passing, alluding back to Sue's reference of transitional spaces being unseen, I begin to expand on my experiences as a child. I embark on the moments when I felt helpless and alone in the world, often seen but not heard. Encompassing elements of corporeality within the piece, Untitled Slump is an autobiographical and alludes to a vulnerable, exhausted, sagging figure located off to the side, barely within the peripheral propped and left in the corner to symbolize detachment emotionally and physically, alluding to the transience of the body and domestic space and the transference of trauma within the domestic object. I wanted to expand the focus on neglect within a temporary moment, a moment of oversight and apathy within an unflattering material of untitled slum. Alluding to Forenzi's definition of trauma while signifying the transference of trauma and security, I again use the relief of a household door to allude to elements of transitory domestic life, transitions of presence while shutting down and hiding from confrontation, alternatively, modifying and referencing the self as an object. Cast from gallons of transparent and opaque wood glue, Untitled Slump represents the self treated in the same manner as my early work, I Am Sunny Jim, set to cure outside without any intervention or disturbance, being left neglected and the outside elements again creating a byproduct of incorporating natural materials, leaves, dirt, and insects within the curing process, alluding back to nature over nurture. During my prior experimentation with residual forms like wood glue, resin, wax, and plaster, I came to discover hidden context within these materials. These materials are apparently secondary and utilitarianism. They are used to cast, bond, mold, acting as placeholders for something else. Ironically, in the sculptural mold making process, these exterior supported molds of plaster are commonly referred to as mother molds. Inspired by the mater materials used by Ava Hess and Robert Gober, I began to look at other materials and develop my own creative vocabulary and aesthetic lexicon to construct and heighten context within my work. In Hess's work, Contingent, Hesse showcases materials as a form. Hesse explains that her main interest in latex fiberglass and other flexible or translucent synthetics was their malleability, their near ugly delicacy, and ambiguous textures, truth to materials. Hesse's material use of latex also leads to the degradation of material over time, the pieces themselves becoming temporal. Furthering this notion of Hesse's approach to materials, I tend to let my materials form and cure without much manipulation, while also addressing another component of experimentation, not fully knowing the temporality of my own chosen materials. Building upon his memory and experiences 
Gober turns his material choices of domestic objects into an allegorical lexicon. Gober states, for the most part, the objects that I choose are almost all emblems of transition. They're objects that you complete with your body. They're objects that in one way or another transform you, like the sink from dirty to clean, the beds from conscious to unconscious, rational thought to dreaming. The doors transform you in a sense that you are speaking of, moving from one place to another. Reflecting on Gober's use of transitory and corporality within materials, I use this notion of transitionary states of being to further validate my material choice of wood glue and my pieces, sheets, and slump. Reading of an encounter Gober had while walking on the shore of Long Island, I continued to explore context to materiality within my works. Gober describes a time he encountered dock styrofoam, wash ashore. He is struck by the unfamiliar black color of the styrofoam material. Gover replicates the form of this styrofoam into a bronze cast of the object in this piece untitled, shown here. By casting in heavy material like bronze, Gover is subduing the inherent qualities of the styrofoam. Lightness and buoyancy, now gone. Painting the bronze cast to resemble the familiar white styrofoam rectangle, Gover executes a trompe l'oeil and disguises the mediation of the found object. Expanding on materials like wax and plaster, which are common household materials, I also use them for the association act of finishing or repairing. Wax is a material that is transient, ethereal, and temporal. Those qualities are demonstrated here in Donald Lipsky's piece, Untitled Saxophone. The combination of brass and melting wax, reminiscent of material used, found within the lost casting method of metal. In my work, Prayer Chair, I build on the use of wax and wooden chair and their affiliated domestic meaning to express an experience of barricading. This barricading of myself to protect myself from a real or perceived threat. While I am invoking a particularly unpleasant childhood memory of growing up in a traumatic household, in prayer chair, I'm depicting a fleeting moment of desperation, vulnerability. I use the imagery of repetition and presence of time with temporal materials to encompass the futility within confrontation. Position above the top of prayer chair, a cast of wax doorknobs melting into themselves, alluding to the passage of time and repetition. I consider the act of propping the chair against the door knob an act to barricade, to defend, to secure, to protect, ultimately to feel safe. The false sense of security and desperation is my admission to prayer chair. The use of wax within prayer chair interpreting the transitional period between matter, the futility of casting wax doorknobs, an object usually sturdy and reinforced by metal, now replicated by the disposable and delicate material wax, a callback to the relationship of the lost wax method. The ethereal qualities of wax registers a haunting intangibility. The fragility and impermanence of form evokes an air of futility and function. The drips of wax layer upon layer delineate the repetition of a desperate act. Realizing this is the same movement of layering and ladling hot wax, mimicking it back and forth to barricade oneself. The arms of the disheveled chair are inverted to pose as prayer hands, a prayer of hope, another act of futility within a fleeting moment. As the physicality of the chair recedes into the wax, seemingly vanishing, in a moment of transition, I tend to evoke the viewer with a recall of something intangible, feeling our memory that was once suppressed. When I often think of fond memories of a place, I often think of a museum, a classroom, or even a friend's house. But when considering my old childhood home, a place real with unpleasant memories, it is still a place that I avoid as an adult. The term negative space embodies my memory of home, a space that is filled with emptiness and negative experiences, left with a longing sense to fill the void from my childhood experiences. I explore the use of negative space and materiality within my works and the works of Bruce Nauman and Rachel White Reed. Bruce Nauman's sculpture, a cast of the space under my chair, solidifies the negative space that exists under his chair by casting it in cement. By encapsulating the space, Nauman brings the intangible into a physical realm. Nauman solidifies the space that lives within our peripheral, the space that we consider, that we encounter daily within our routine but overlook. Within my work, the idea of the space that surrounds us unseen is the negative experiences that seemingly haunt my memory of domestic objects within my space. The influence of Nauman's 
a cast of the space under my chair would extend into the works of another influential artist within my practice, Rachel White Reed. White Reed continues Nauman's dialogue around negative space with such works as House and Water Tower. Casting the negative spaces within the interiors of a vacated housing unit, White Reed expresses the sentiment of the memories negative spaces can invoke. By recalling an experience of helping her father laying concrete in her basement floor, the process of looking and emptying and filling running through her work, revealing how surfaces of daily life can disappear and reappear, bearing the traces of their previous lives, again solidifying the space once occupied. Now absent of inhabitants, the space has become a haunting memory of the lives and experiences now gone. By contrast, Water Tower by Rachel White Reed is the negative cast of an interior space, absence of the structural housing, leaving only the form of an interior of a neighborhood water tower. The image of a solidified and tangible resource, water seemingly frozen and withheld from the families below. In Water Tower, White Reed seems to capture a moment right before a crescendo. The resin casted in a form seemingly ready to explode as if the water is suspended right as its housing was removed. Beginning to address the concept of domestic objects, I convey a metaphor of, domestic, of negative space and trauma by casting a relief of an actual door out of wood glue, alluding back to the inherent relationship of wood glue and wood. I begin to create a dialogue between the substitution of an object's materiality, reproducing a domestic form using synthetic materials. Like White Reed's Water Tower, I wanted to elevate the levels of drama within my own work, setting out to create an element of suspense by exhibiting the tearing and tension of materials within the form, creating a piece seemingly ready to fracture and crumble to the floor. My piece, Untitled, addresses the experience in an act of barricade, showcased in an imprinted relief of a door cast in a bright yellow-orange alternative material wood glue. This piece is left hanging and sagging boarded and nailed to a wall. The door seemingly fragile and broken, the presence of a threat seemingly breaking through, the rotten wood planks seemingly haphazardly hammered into place, embracing an aspect of desperation. The wood planks positioned as an X and O seemingly represented the hollowed aspect of the hugs and kisses within my household. The material is stretched and torn, leaving ripples and marks resembling elements of cuts or wounds likened as a knife to skin or an ax to a door, building tension and evidence of trauma. Likewise, in lowercase i, again, I negate the presence of a door as a pathway, but rather in my works, a barrier. For example, I explore the concept of negation within action in this piece by creating a negative cast of a bedroom door hammered by rusty nails to form cursive text, spelling out, I love you. My intention to create a mixed message by alluding to a phrase of endearment use, using materials and processes that suggest other meanings, including the cliche that actions may speak louder than words. First development of the text alludes to aspects of formality, the same way you would write, I love you within a birthday card, a sentiment scribed and thrown away rather than a sentiment expressed verbally. In this pre piece, the phrase, I love you has lost its meaning. The act of being barricaded and eroded transforms the words into nothing more than decoration. Leaving the material left to sag and ripple on its own weight and essence of gravity adds to the drama within the moment of solace. The synthetic door made of wood glue acts again as a falsehood of security within domestic space. Draped on the wall, held in place by rusty nails, the material conforms and contours around this support system, curing and solidifying in place. Revisiting Doho Su's work, I want to focus on his piece, Home Within a Home Within a Home Within a Home. Su captures a contrast of impermanence of salt, of space and memory by rendering his family home in South Korea out of wireframe and fabric, now swallowed by the magnitude of his current home in New York. Referencing the same material, Su expresses his personal experiences of space within his works by stating, I try to understand my life as a movement through different spaces. Su coincides the space of the past with the space of the present, creating an ethereal yet haunting depiction of previous aspects of life represented within this space. Sue states his South Korean scholar's home was a sort of simulation. It was not a real home for a scholar. It was a home simulated that simulated the scholar's house. There was no original. Sue's story emboldens the dichotomy of the ideal and the reality 
confirming that his reference of the home is inspired by a model home that never existed. The idea of home as a manifestation of an artificial space furthered my reflection of the delusion of home that I had as a child. This newfound sense of perception versus reality inspired me to create and document the physicality of my childhood home. The documenting of my childhood home would be impartial. It would be unbiased from experience and allow for the real space to transcend memory or ideology. During an Art 21 expose, Rubbing and Loving by Doho Su, Su manages to document the interior spaces from his previous apartment in New York. Within the clip, Su is seen meticulously rubbing every crevice and corner of his old apartment, giving an importance to the unseen overlooked, drawing the viewer into a space seemingly represented into a two-dimensional method. Su states upon closer inspection, the three-dimensional aspects start to take shape. To me, the idea of archiving and registering a space transcends the initial space, is the act of documenting for the sake of recall and reminiscence in lieu of dependency on memory. Sue expresses the act of rubbing and as a loving act, a way to memorialize the time and routine spent from living in a space. Within my next series, Plates, I focus on the elements of archiving and documenting textures of the physical surface found within my actual childhood home, creating rubbings from my actual childhood house in Orlando, Florida. In this series, I use a method of rubbing to take off the blue pigment from the transfer paper to attract the pigment rather than apply it, leaving behind a negative impression to the texture, thus still documenting the space as a negative space. Creating this work brings back memories of my childhood experience of being in a program for architecture, designing imaginary floor plans and drawing of the perfect home, meanwhile returning back to my broken home. Using materials found within the process of drafting blueprints, pigmented transfer paper on paper, a blueprint represents the simulacra of the house intended to be built. This is a perfect version of the home copy. The intention to use a retraction method within the process is to counter the reference of Doho Su's rubbing and loving, where Su interprets rubbing as a loving act, now used to uncover and trace negative experiences from my own home. As seen in rubbing 14, the negative space representing a hole punched through a door. The rubbing is then casted onto a wax plate. This is to revisit the idea of substitutive material of wax and the absence of permanence within my work. Like into an ideal or fleeting memory of space, alluding back to my lexicon of materials in this series, I am substituting wax as a placeholder of the material as more resilient and functional, metal plating used to strengthen or reinforce the building material. Given that the wax is temporal and unstable, this alludes to the delicacy and fragility within my memory of the home. Plate three seen here is the rubbing of the corner of my childhood bedroom, an overlooked aspect of a room until made to gaze into its abyss. Now it becomes the focal point. Another, plate four, is the rubbing of my childhood bedroom window, a means to escape seemingly tarnished by the presence of a security bar. Within plates, there is allusion to putting outward an aspect of keeping up with appearances as a family unit likened to putting out fine china an ambivalent display of a model family. The illusion to find China is heightened by the presence of blue pigment from the transfer paper, contrasting the opaqueness of the white wax, mimicking the blue underglazed paint usually found decorating the white porcelain. My piece, let me show you the door, depicts two stories. One story display of what should be viewed, the other what lies within. Showcase has a freestanding door within the piece, within the space. The piece acts as an invisible barrier the entrance into a space beyond this threshold. At first glance, it appears to be a door attached polished to present an attractive exterior. The alternative side, a neglected door, distressed and peeling, leaving the interior in shambles, adds to the trauma and drama that lies within the home. The untold elements and events that are only seen within the space, thus creating a conversation of the perception of the exhibit public, simultaneously hiding the internal crisis within closed doors. The aspects of trauma trace back to the duality of forensics, splitting of the self, one left to decay, the other to live a normal life. While I entered graduate school with a predetermined ideas about the works I plan to make using pop culture inspired themes with an intention of being edgy and trendy, I am now leaving the program with more questions than answers. 
understanding that I have my own voice, individuality, and creative purpose. Somewhere along the way, it became clear that I had stopped asking questions and started accepting answers and excuses, as it felt easier to be told what to think rather than to think for myself. Addressing personal traumas within my work, I address a yearning to resolve by processing my experiences of trauma and objection into more healthy understanding of myself and redress for reoccurring notions of fear, isolation, shame, and incompleteness, both figuratively and literally. Like in Tabourgeois' destruction to the, of the father, I confront and exercise these experiences to further a deeper resolution within myself. No longer the child my mother raised to be seen and not heard. My body of work evolved with a rediscovered independent voice. Rather than skirting my past, I began focusing on the traumas within my early life that had led me to become passive and anxious, addressing transitional states of space in the human body, themes of corporeality, ephemerality, and transference emerged within my works. Understanding that I have, be, that I have come from a history of trauma, I cannot blame any individual in my family for the trauma they are victim to, but I can only hope they find ways to deter from the path of the brawler for the sake of their family. Thank you all for joining me today. At this time, I would like to open it up for questions from my committee. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And so I'm wondering, but if they think, unless I missed it, you didn't use the word narrative. <laughs> so maybe, but now I'd like to be if you could have um, I'm wondering if you could speak, though, to sort of how you understand the role of narrative um, in your work and, you know, maybe by extension, how, how stories, how narrative um, sort of... Uh, I guess, informs your engagement with trauma. Yeah, yeah so it, it definitely, um, like my family is big on storytelling. And, and it's, it's usually um, when I reference like the aspect of uh, their own follies that they're completely non-cognizant of it, um, it goes back to being around a table and then rehashing and telling stories of trauma. And then that reflection on myself, figuring out how do the stories actually translate within my work? And as an adult, reflectively looking back and finding Oh, that story of like, oh, you threw my uncle through a glass pane. Cool. Uh, that's a horrible thing to do. So maybe we shouldn't we shouldn't laugh about it. And it's actually that's trauma within the house. So using that and then also touching back on aspects of watching TV or movies, you see the the ideal family on on the screen, right? And then you look back into yourselves and you find those same stories that are translated within an episode of like even married with children, right? That was the closest thing I had as a kid to, to, to a dysfunctional family that I could relate, but even that still wasn't like aspects of trauma, but finding that those stories and those combinations of dialogue, I had that within each of my experiences. So like for this, for instance, Sheets, this is the one that kind of stands alone in the sense that this is a positive feeling. This is a positive story of running through and kind of expressing the allegorical themes of running through laundry and shutting off of the space in my grandmother's house. Um, but yeah, kind of contrasting that with aspects of what you see on TV, what you hear in your family, and then what as an adult, you kind of now reflect back on to find those pieces that are haunting and that shouldn't be, shouldn't be celebrated. So first of all, congratulations on your Thank you. Uh, now that your work is installed in the gallery and you can kind of get all the 
faculty voices out of your head and collaborate with people in the gallery, your cohort. But now looking at your show uh, and the work, what if anything uh, did you learn about your work by putting it in this space? And, and what if anything would you do differently in hindsight? I think, I think learning how the pieces together speak to one another, how it creates an environment itself, uh, which is which is why I wanted to begin with this door as a centerpiece, right? So this is creating a threshold into this space and then referring back to sheets as an aspect of a positive passage out. So acting as like a barrier to transform into the next space. Um, as far as like any addition, I probably would address the wax plates a little bit better, um, probably creating a more mantelpiece for them to display on independent of one another just to reference more of a fine china uh, aspect but that is more for just building the installation for that piece so why three pieces too i mean that was a curiosity for me is there a reason in that number that's symbolic uh not specifically not within that experience but i do have them propped to have a negative experience within the middle so the grittier, dirtier one is represented by the two barriers of the positive one. So these aspects of like doors and bricks, but also focusing in on the corner to make the viewer kind of gaze into that corner as a middle focus. And we also talked about the possibility of making it more of a, another, another derivation, making it more like a domestic space by, you know, maybe putting in some baseboard on the wall so that there's a continuation that seems more like a house or painting the wall or doing wallpaper, you know, all things that would be the next generation of possibly showing the work. Um, do you see those as, uh, as something you would weigh in next time? I, I definitely do because it does become more formal in the gallery setting, the, the whiteness kind of contrasting uh, with the yellow kind of puts it into a non-approachable gallery aesthetic opposed to if wallpaper were on it or if the doors were hanging around the barrier itself indicating the domestic space so there are there are ideas of working within and creeping and crawling of the domestic space to the viewer as well we have a question from um, professor poindexter Carla, can you hear us I cannot hear you. Well, I can hear Jeremy very well. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Congratulations, Jeremy, on a, a good presentation. I have several questions, and I'll start with that there are aspects to your installation and your work that hit emotional edges and others that are more, I don't know, distanced, removed, more abstracted, just as in Rachel White Reed's house as compared to the water tower. The house has a, an enormous impact. The water tower is a little bit removed. Will you, first of all, clarify to us and the audience the differences between those two pieces? Yeah, so so house itself, um, building kind of like the negative shell from the interiors of a home. Um, White Reed is locking in the aspects of those inhabitants and experiences within that home, right? So talking about the aspect of relaying floor and stripping away floor and then laying the concrete down with her father and kind of this act of cleansing the space and rediscovering it and repurposing it. Whereas Water Tower, typically that like the object itself is withheld from the, the intended audience. So this aspect of like nurture, right? This water tower that's stuck and frozen in place, now not able to go down to those families below, the neighborhood below, but also kind of creating that suspense that it looks rigid and frozen in space to collapse at any time, which is kind of what I wanted to uh, tap into as far as like uh, lowercase i and uh, untitled, uh, where it seems like these things are going to break at any moment. It's going to burst and fall to the floor. Absolutely. But I'm talking about something else, too. I'm talking about the potency of this house uh, existing in a neighborhood where all the other houses are 
gone. There's a fence around it. It's this concrete feeling of an interior and the potency that must have had for the people who walked by, yada, yada, as opposed to the water tower that we see only in the document of the photograph, unless we happen to go there. Um, there is something about the emotional impact of some of your pieces, as opposed to the lack of emotional impact of some of the others. Um, so, for example, let's just ask a very simple question. You showed us a picture of slump in the corner. And that was very potent, that rug-like anthropologic, I mean, anthropomorphic form sitting in the corner. Whereas in the gallery, it's up against a wall. And it doesn't feel as potent. That the lack of the corner, I thought, was an important aspect. What happened? Um, so it, from how it is in the gallery, it should be propped up in the, in the corner. So it is in the corner um, and then it is in the corner of the actual entrance to the space. So, so kind of the aspect of slump is to be unseen and hidden. Um, so once, uh, yeah, oh, there it is. It was moved. Um, okay. It might have been during like a, an install period where okay. uh, <laughs> playing with the space, but it is kind of uh, to invoke an aspect of the viewer coming in, seeing uh, this area more or less and kind of walking past and in the peripheral. I get it. I get it. Obscuring. Yeah. The yeah. It's, it's correctly placed now. And I didn't realize that because I'm not there. Okay. So then we have other things like it, the door uh, where we see the plaster of the door, you know, and then on the other side, it's torn into. And yet in, in comparison, I'm not even talking about the rubbings. In comparison, you've got the chair with all the knobs and you explain to us what those knobs meant and what the suggestion of the chair tilted meant. But we didn't get the same kind of impactful emotive experience that we get with the door or the slump because there isn't that other than the knobs, unless we really contemplate it, we don't immediately get it that the chair is actually barricade, barricading a door. Do you feel like you made a mistake? You didn't fulfill it? Or how would you defend your piece to me? Um, so, so there is also a process within that piece that uh, comes within the labeling of the wax. So kind of like, um, not specifically referencing like Richard Serra's like pieces where he's splashing uh, metal into the crevices of the gallery, but there is a, a movement within the process. So like almost the act of adding these doors and the repetition of adding these doorknobs, creating the repetition of barricading. And that's the presence of the drips creating a presence of time, right? Of the fleetingness. Um, the, the chair itself is also a dining chair. I know I don't touch on this too much, but it is a chair that is used to usually bring families together in this instance, propping it against the door is separating from the family. So there is an element of the function of the object kind of creating the, the process as well in the piece. But do you see the difference between you having to explain all the symbolic elements that exist in it or the processes that are a, um, a remnant of what you've done as opposed to the door or the slump or several other pieces that truly do not need explanation. We, we get the sheets hanging on a clothesline and the space between the two sheets, you know, uh, giving us a sensation of comfort where some of the other pieces in your show um, are quite different in their intellectual and emotional impact. So, okay, so I have already asked you to defend that. My question is, when you started your talk today, I felt very strongly that this could be a very strong political, social, you could be an activist or an advocate for endangered children and abused children. And your talk could be effective, but then at a certain point you, move into a, into the whole realm of art and art not so much as a political vehicle, but art for the sake of art. So 
Can you see yourself being a political activist? Is there an act? Is there an aspect of your work that is activism or advocatism? I'm work, working within those themes. They they are inherently like heavy to to grasp. Um, but there there are aspects to figure out how to translate this into a, a possible positive public function. I know recently, I think Jason shared an email out with us for a, a children's center looking for public arts. Mm -hmm. And within the tagline of that children's center, it said, this is a safe space for art. And th that aspect of creating like a safe space piece, mm -hmm. correlating the aspects of what we're hiding as far as the trauma outside the world for this moment within this building. is something that I, I would like kind of like fascinated with of like, how can I translate this into a more positive aspect to present these, these experiences, but also to protect in a sense. Why would it have to be a positive thing? Yeah, I mean, aspects of you know, I mean, within a safe space. Yeah, to me, uh, part of the power of your piece is the fact that it is visceral and physical and I mean where we can speak of child abuse or we can see the abuse on actual humans this kind of powerful emotive response to your childhood it, it appears to me that it doesn't need to be spoken about it could be an exhibit that is somewhere maybe travels uh, where people can go and become very aware on a physical level of what it means to be uh, uh, um, under the influence of a toxic mother and environment. Um, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about changing your work from, you know, focused on this discussion of art to uh, becoming an advocate? I mean, it, I, I appreciate that uh, empowerment, um, but it, it actually, yeah, it isn't something that I, I thought about, but it definitely seems plausible in the aspect of figuring out how to create the right environment and the right work to translate those. I know like me and Shannon, Lindsay talked about, a lot about this, like the funnel aspect of art. So like coming, you have all these ideas, it narrows down and then when you leave, you leave with a lot more ideas. So right now my, my head, as far as next steps, there's a lot of works in place, but now seemingly I could figure out how to correlate those together to speak kind of like this does within the space, using those pieces to create that conversation. Mm -hmm. One more, if you don't mind. Um, okay, so first I want you to just identify the purpose of Ava Hess's work uh, the one in particular that you showed us, it remains, or much of her work remains where it was originally built because it's too fragile to be moved. And it doesn't appear to have any actual conceptual significance in the narrative sense that you are dealing with it. And the same in, in many ways, um, Do Han So, or Do Ho So. Uh, there's a kind of a removal of emotions in, in these. So define for us, if you will, the how your work compares to both of them in terms of the narrative. Okay, would you do that? Yeah, so in, in terms of the narrative, as far as Sue's work on um, like trans, transitory spaces, so this aspect of this ephemeral transitory space, uh, using that aspect of materiality and this ephemeral quality of the materiality and translating that into a transference of trauma. So kind of in a sense where there's transitional spaces, there's transitional aspects of the being within my work. So like the shedding of skin, the evolution of the self, these transitionary states that you may not see that you experience in a way. Um, as far as Ava Hess's work, uh, did, like contingent that piece, uh, there is an inherent quality of the materialist self not being able to stand dependently. So there's aspects where she puts and reinforces certain things. So this idea of independence within my work, creating a form that will just independently stick is, is kind of what I'm capturing, but also the ephemeral qualities of those pieces, like you mentioned. So the latex degrades and doesn't hold up within its time. That aspect of this trauma kind of transferring and degrading and causing resolution, but then 
kind of going back in different forms in a sense. Okay, so it got you to those things got you to the kind of materials and uh, okay, I, I can I, I can see that. It's a good answer. Um, all right, I'll let somebody else ask a question. I still have others, but go ahead. I think that Carla's point about the, the possible activist application of your work is, is interesting. I, I just feel like it would be really critical for you to, to know what work you're making and who you're making it for. I remember in the beginning, you were illustrating or depicting feelings about other people with Heather, and you were almost sort of a generation removed from the experience, you hadn't quite internalized what you wanted to say about your own life, which is really what you were talking about, the injustice to kids in other countries and things, or even stateside, what felt to me at the time that you were safely trying to address the pain you felt without actually dealing with it. And while I think the new series, when you pivoted, I don't know what caused you to pivot necessarily, but was when you turned inward, right? Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the skins that you feel outdoors were like shedding of a snake skin or feeling your own, you know, we all shed our skin as we evolve into the new us, right? So I think making sure that you remain dutiful about using the process, it seemed like the process of the work was an act of healing in a way, that the more you made that work, the more you came to terms with it. So I, I would want you to be clear-minded about that if you decide to, to move in another direction. Uh, my question is um, relating to the very beginning, the first three words of your abstract are, is trauma tangible? And so after three years in our program, we're home and we an exhibition and a written thesis that's uh, moving along nicely. Um, looking at other influences of artists, looking at your work and or writing from some of the people you're, you're citing uh, as a source material. Tell us how trauma is tangible, if it is, uh, and give us some examples in, in, in how that operates in your work. Yeah, so I think, I think the answer is yes and no, right? There is, <laughs> there is no fully uh, descriptive aspect, but reading and reading like affect and theory, like uh, they, they talk about this sense of body and feeling becoming one. So it becomes irrelevant whether it's physical or ephemeral, it, it is just now one feeling and one fleeting moment. Um, within my works, as far as like promise tangible, as far as like untitled right here, EXO, um, I'm trying to depict those aspects of trauma that seep in. So this cut you see in the middle, this tearing, uh, kind of these aspects of uh, mended, like a wound kind of mending in itself, but also popping back up and looking freshly uh, preserved, kind of like how trauma, it basically triggers, right? So it, it, within my abstract, I'd say domestic spaces my trigger, right? Um, these are things that pop up that inherently get either Put away or address in the moment. They cause a fight or flight experience within that time. So, as far as like the physicality of trauma, it does have a physiological aspect sure. when you experience a memory. So, in, in I am Sunny Jim, that sewing, the, the puncturing through seemed like an act of wounding and an act of healing or stitching together. Uh, in retrospect, having made this work you know, with your mother as a subject or, or a source. Um, did it pull you closer to her, to understanding her or forgiving her? <laughs> or did it increase that? How, how did it end up feeling to you? It, it's complicated because I, I will yeah. say, I will say inherently like, I love my mother, I don't like my mother. It's, 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 it's a combination of both. Like I, I there are aspects of, this individual uh, has been in my life for a while, but understanding that this aspect of the mother that I had and kind of talking to Carl Jung's yeah. archetype of the mother that we hold is decay, that, yeah. that, that mother is long gone. Um, and we'll never kind of <laughs> see, see the light of day. So there is an aspect of the punching and sewing that's also like kind of stitching up a corpse in a way too, yeah. like you're sewing up. 
in these pieces. Thank you. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Melissa. I'm asking about how you, um, you mentioned the blog notion of the cathartic resolution. Um, and I am just curious as to what you have to think about that, maybe in relationship to like your own practice. And I'll, I guess just to flush that out, like an understanding of trauma, like talks about how it is a kind of, it, which is maybe what kind of instigated my, my original question about narrative. Um, this idea that trauma ruptures, it's like the lack of narrative coherence mm -hmm. and trauma is the event or experience that like makes narrative coherence of like one's own life kind of impossible. And so the idea then of like the resolution or like finding the narrative to help kind of like bind back, bind oneself back together within a kind of coherent narrative of the self, right? Like my understanding of what this idea of like resolution is all about. So that's interesting. Like just like <laughs> whatever memories, um, fragmented, cells like all the kinds of things that you're talking about throughout your paper um but then there's maybe the the other question of like how much resolution like you know do you feel resolved maybe is the question or is that even important because it totally doesn't have to be you know just in the same way that like an uplift narrative doesn't have to be what you're seeking out you know? like <laughs> i was thinking about arthur j uh, um, video or he's, he's his work deals with trauma in a totally different register, but he's just like, he's always asked that. He's just like, oh no, uplift's not my thing. I'm the undertaker. <laughs> so, I mean, art doesn't have to do that, right? Like it's an option to like opt out of the idea of providing resolution, but they're just like, what is your kind of thought about that? I, I think like through this through this experience, it's, it's an awareness within my routine. So the aspect of like locking doors, I will, I will enter our bedroom, my wife will be right behind me and I will shut the door and lock it. So it's, it's an aspect of that is like, uh, that is my home has shaped me to be an individual of this routine. And then being aware of like these aspects of why, why am I doing that? Why am I longing to sleep on a couch for like safety? So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it, I mean, and that's the thing is I am, I'm the product and now like it's, it's hard to specifically focus on one specific aspect of trauma because it is, uh, there's like a subconscious fail state within like mm -hmm. that blocks it off. And then there's something that triggers it and you're like, Oh wow. I just have this memory of a bad car ride or uh, this aspect of something happening. Um, so once those like now with the eye of like ha having body of art, understanding like, you know, how, to pull that out and resolve it to the physical realm. Do you feel, again, do you feel as though it is and it doesn't even matter one way or the other to you that like, like does the work have to produce or somehow provide a sense of resolution or are you okay with it being messily and intentionally unresolved, like not unresolved and like he didn't think about it bad, but like intentionally unresolved, like productively unresolved. No, not, not necessarily, because I think a lot of the resolution happens within the process. So like for, for these sheets, uh, like the wax uh, linen on the door, there's a process of wrestling and like pooling and like I am, I am like physically fighting with this to come off, right? So there, there's an exerted element of energy given to me within the process that I find kind of cathartic back to bourgeois aspect. Hi. Oh, I think you're still muted. So is it my turn to ask a there question? You go. Okay, I'd like to pick up on Melissa's train of thought because it's extremely important. And Melissa, uh, as one of your committee members who is um, uh, a theorist, a researcher, a historian, and then from my point of view, also believing I do those things, but also more, I am more, I respond more to the object and to the thing. So what she asked you is, do your objects, do your pieces need to provide resolution? I'm not sure if you answered that 
in the way that she may have intended, but if not, or if you did, maybe not in the way I want to hear. So that's what I was trying to get to, and she asked it much more eloquently. But that idea that some of your pieces provide total resolution, but they don't, they don't explain themselves. The slump in the corner, we look at it, we have a intellectual understanding of what it is, an emotive understanding. Then as we look closer, we see the bugs and the junk. Then we see it in the context of the room. So it does provide resolution. And so does the door, okay? All, most, of, in fact, I feel all of them do, except maybe the rubbings. The rubbing seemed to be the beginning of something. We get the context based on what you said uh, in terms of, you know, just beginning, but it doesn't feel, they just feel like a specimen right now. And I don't see a resolution at all. And therefore it's not as powerful emotively, intellectually, a piece of work as the others, as most of the others. I think that's what I was trying to say about the door too. I mean, the mm -hmm. tilted chair. I'm not getting the immediate, physical, visceral impact that I want. It, it's going to, I'm going to have to read about it or take more time with it to even get to what you intended. So I want you to talk about that. I want you to talk about this idea of how does the work have to produce a, a resolution in the, in the sense that I'm talking about, that impact, that kind of physical impact. Maybe you can talk about the rubbings. Are they resolved? It definitely depends on the body. There are there are aspects of like the the piece I am sending Jim about my mother, that that was cathartic and needed a resolution. Right? That was I'm putting elements of like my actual family history of a photograph in there. I'm destroying uh, these memories and and that becoming a resolution in itself of like moving beyond but within the, the wax plates uh, those are more for the sake of discovery of archiving uh, so those pieces not seeking resolution they they become an aspect of reflecting back on these experiences with a memory so kind of documenting uh, what is reality what is the simulacra of like what is the ideal what is the copy but let's go back to a piece you did not hang in the show, and that is the piece with the two breasts and the embedded photo, like you said. And then you talked about the lullaby, literally, that your mother sang to you, which was extremely potent. So was that made, did that help you literally therapeutically? Did it, was it a therapy to get through that and to help, did, did it help you to transcend your experiences, so being therapeutic, and that's why you didn't put it into the show. But why didn't you put that piece into the show, I guess? It would be my first question. <laughs> so that piece is uh, like very biographical, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's very like inherently a specific mm -hmm. subject matter. Mm -hmm. um, that, that specific piece for this format, I, didn't, I chose not to put in just because I didn't want to embarrass uh, my mother specifically uh, within a gallery setting. All right. Um, granted, it is cathartic. It does also seem personal for me <laughs> as a resolution, so not inherent to display it in, in a sense. So it is okay. there is a therapeutic resolution that I don't think is needed for for the viewer in, in, in the gallery setting. Well, maybe for this. If, if that answers. Maybe for this gallery setting, an MFA gallery setting, I agree with the embarrassment of your mother and your family being so private. However, it goes back to my first question. Could this be, it's an awfully potent public message. And it would take you out of the realm of what you're doing right now. But have you, it, it's almost like a challenge. You know, I, yeah, I, mean, I remember I, the first time I had to embarrass my parents with my art, you know, I think in a different way, of course. What was it? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the, the last part. You might have cut out. Well, OK, I'm sorry, too. Um, you know, I think that 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 uh, transference from personal and biographical to public and uh, abstract is where your work is right now. It's that, it's the big question, you know. 
And uh, I think you answered my question beautifully. It was not appropriate in your opinion in this particular gallery, but it, it may be extremely appropriate when you consider Louise Bougeot's spider. Right. Definitely, yeah. And, and you are kind of um, positioning something that I fully haven't actually thought or, or <laughs> like, like there is such a chronological thing of like, I. I have to finish this degree and then like now does that mean I'm an artist or inherently am I constantly thinking about this? Uh, mm -hmm. So there is possible room for evolution of those works that I haven't really tapped into. Mm -hmm. But thank you, yeah. Well, I guess what I'm asking. I, I agree about the, the, the wax stuff. I, I do think it is colder and more depersonalized and a little bit, um, the process of making it was more interesting. Even the details you put in the presentation, those detail shots were beautiful. So legibility and accessibility are impeded by the way the wax is used now. And the scale and shape of the wax, the mode of presentation in terms of that, that gallery shot, you know, finding an old hutch, you know, with shelving, painting it all white and installing in it or having some plate shapes or different size picture shapes, I think the variation is going to have to change a lot or do a rubbing of the whole wall with the vent in the doorway and let the scale of that be at the same scale that the doors are. But something, I, I agree, I, I think maybe, maybe we agree about slightly different things, but I think those, that seemed more inaccessible and, and even though it was personal for you, it doesn't come off in the same effectual way that the other works do. Yep. I <laughs> I'll, I'll respond to that. So yeah. I, I do agree just because this is a newly found process. Uh, there are aspects where I am starting to experiment experience with a, a process that I uh, found with uh, my independent study with Hadi. Uh, there was a process for Yunaki uh, glaze, and that is the pigment that is used for a painting of uh, porcelain and blue. So I, there's this idea that I am going to kind of dry out this glaze, put it on transfer paper, treat it the same way as the rubbings, yeah. and then transfer that to something like fine china. So there, there are aspects of still evolving this idea that isn't fully formed or <laughs> resolved in sense. Do you want to go to the committee, you say? Yeah, I mean, so we couldn't, uh, if the committee is out of questions, we could go to the audience, but let's check with the committee first. Are there any, are there any questions from the committee members? I'm okay. Yes, I can be done for now, definitely. Okay. Would love to hear from the audience. So we're Point to questions from the audience. Are there any questions? Please remember, we they need to be worded as questions. Go. Thanks so Thanks so much, Jeremy. Um, I did want to ask. I think that it's really, um, I think it's really powerful and brave artists like yourself who make work about personal traumas. And so my question is, what sort of negotiations do you make when you're considering the work and the future of your work in terms of self-preservation, how much you disclose through the work, and how much you keep to yourself? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it is it's it's walking like a tightrope because I still have to be respectful of my wife I live with that I want to continue having a great relationship with. Uh, sorry for her to have married an artist, but uh, there are aspects that probably will uh, not make it into shows because they are personal as far as like aspects of collecting hair or things from like <laughs> biological aspects that maybe aren't translated into domestic objects within the space. Um, or finding like, you know, at the end of the day, my mother is a human being with feelings that I have to also be respectful and find ways to, to address those themes and impacts from my perspective. Uh, and that's why, that's why my art initially changed from the beginning because there were altruistic visions of me feeling complicit to these experiences of other people and trying to find the identity within myself to talk about my experiences from my perspective um, without divulging too much to make it too personal and rather than kind of launching it into a universal aspect. 
if that if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah. I got a couple part question. Um, the first part is uh, how does color kind of play a role in your work? Um, I noticed that like this door being uh, white versus like the yellows and stuff that you're incorporating some of the other like, pieces. And uh, the second part is like a uh, site specific uh, also play a role in your work and like my activity between the pieces. Uh, you know, there's when you tend to want to walk around as a door that like, you want, you know, later on to be able to be able to open uh, work or walk through the space and stuff like that differently. But you're going to talk more about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the colors are specific to the material itself. So, uh, the discovery of this material kind of like it's it to like decayed yellow skin, um, but the vibrancy also gives kind of an alertness, right? So, there's an aspect of kind of uh, like a yellow tape on a crime scene where there is a highlight of something traumatic has happened. Please don't, <laughs> please don't move beyond, right? There's an alert aspect within the piece. Uh, the whiteness kind of reflects to like the flatness of the space or the purity on one side. Um, for instance, like this, this is just the natural use of the paraffin. Uh, the reason paraffin is used within it is also because it's aspects used within prayer candles, but also used within therapeutic process as well. Um, so same thing for the whiteness of that, used for like cosmetic aspect of paraffin. Um, the site specific, uh, that is something that kind of like what Byron was talking about creating like the actual environment using wallpaper. That is something that I haven't fully tapped into yet uh, that I would like to venture into because uh, calling back to Rachel White Reed and kind of calling back to house, that is like specific and, and the aspect that they're taking a house that was a housing unit that people who used to live in it can experience. So for aspects of this door, a door that most commonly people use to enter a space, it is obstructing kind of the space. It is, it is stiffened, right? There's no at functional use of it to kind of open into the space. So you have to move around it. So it again, acts kind of like that barrier within the space. Does that? Does that okay? Cool. <laughs> yes. What is the color of your the door to your home? <laughs> Oh, oh my God, I didn't realize it. it's yellow. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> wow, that is a, a revelation that I didn't realize. It, you didn't realize? I did not. I did not. Was the door that color or did you paint it that color? It, it was that color. Wow. It was, it was that color. I did not realize that. It was part of routine, but yes, I, my house has a yellow door. <laughs> Psyche, right? Right. Mother-in-law comes with her. Yeah. Yeah. All the snake plants. Yeah. In the family photos, there's three children. Yes. yes. So, uh, one is my sister in the pink shirt, and the other is my cousin. Um, he pretty much the reason that my grandmother's house was also special as far as the safe space is because that's when we would hang out. So that was like the weekend was eight, I was able to see my cousin kind of play with somebody my age. My sister is six years older than me, so the disconnect. Uh, sure. you know, an eight year old doesn't want to play with like a two year old. <laughs> so, so yes, that is uh, my cousin and my sister and my father and mother at Disney. Last question. Yeah. What are your plans? I have an insane amount of work I want to do now. <laughs> and my, my plan first is to find a space to do it in. Um, there was a project that Rob Reedy tasked us with in our second semester that I'm very thankful for was uh, to flesh out and price out building your own studio. Uh, so there is a shed in the back of my house that's a 10 by 20 foot shed that I plan this summer to convert. One, to clear up my, my space from the studio, because now that I've created these larger pieces, I have to also figure out how to store them, um, but also experimenting with, hopefully they store well, because like Hess says, what I don't know the end goal for them. Um, but yes, diving into, into a studio space and creating a space to work in is my next step. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.
Any questions from the audience? Any questions from online? Alexander, would you activate your microphone, please? Yes. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, you brought up substance abuse in the beginning, but you didn't really go too deeply into it. Uh, is there a reason why you didn't incorporate that into your works more, the, the substance abuse and the role it played in, in, in uh, your family trauma? Yeah, yeah. So, so there, there are aspects again, kind of touching into like the embarrassment of family or the personal aspects. But there are aspects of um, <laughs> transitory themes. So, like I also personally address, like, is alcoholism uh, inherently genetic? Is uh, drug use genetic? So, these are aspects I'm thinking of when trying to start my own family, and how that may translate into a form of. Uh, transference to the theme of passing on to the generation. Um, the specific aspect of drug abuse, um, there are some family members that I just haven't addressed nor have I talked to in a long time to, to share those stories with, to create those works with. But there are aspects that I think within my personal life, how do I address that? that I haven't really fully incorporated into my works yet. Thank you, Alexander. Last call for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much.